assess uh, the Biden administration's uh, performance on national security in its first 100 days in office. And to do that, we have three conversations beginning in just a minute or two. We'll have a conversation with former National Security Advisor Tom Donilon, former Deputy Secretary of State Steve Began, and that conversation will be moderated by our friend Jennifer Griffin of Fox News. At 10.30 a.m. here in the United States, we'll have a second conversation with the new Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kath Hicks, Kathleen Hicks, moderated by another good friend of ours, Helene Cooper, the Pentagon correspondent of the New York Times. And then at 11.30 a.m. this morning, so two hours from now, a third and final conversation. And that's when our good friend, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, will be interviewed by another friend from the Wall Street Journal, Jerry Seib. The Aspen Strategy Group um, has a radical notion uh, that's the core of our mission. And that is that Republicans, Democrats, and independents here in the United States ought to be able to get along ought to be able to meet together to talk about the major national security challenges that we face. We've been doing that for 37 years. I wanna pay tribute to our current co-chairs, uh, Joe Nye, Professor Joe Nye of Harvard University, who's one of the founders of this organization and Professor Condoleezza Rice, Stanford University, director of the Hoover Institution and the former secretary of state. We're delighted that you're here with us today. I would just say as a way of setting the ground for these conversations, we've seen a major revolution in my judgment in American foreign policy under President Biden's leadership. He has started with the belief and the core belief that I think is right, obviously, that the United States has to repair itself at home, strengthen itself at home, strengthen the middle class here in the United States in order to be successful overseas. And thus, you've seen the president's focus uh, on the pandemic on the issue of refloating our economy, on the continued challenges to our democracy as evidenced by what happened in Washington on January 6th, and certainly in doing much more to make sure that America is a nation of racial equality and racial justice. Those four imperatives at home obviously have been the focal point of this administration, but we've also seen a major change overseas we've seen a, a refocus on the power of our alliances, building up NATO to contain Russia, forming and having the first quad meeting of, of heads of government so that Australia, Japan, the United States and India are working to limit China's growth and China's ambitions in the Indo-Pacific. We've seen a major focus of this administration on climate change in the, important, in the appointments of John Kerry and Gina McCarthy in the work of President Biden in hosting uh, the first, his first major summit last week, the virtual summit on climate change attended by, um, by heads of government of all the major emitters in the world. That was a positive event. We're certainly seeing a major focus on China and our competition with China for military power in the Indo-Pacific, our competition on trade to make sure that China plays by the rules of international trade, which is not doing now. Our competition technologically in AI and machine learning, biotech and quantum sciences and the militarization of those technologies. And certainly what President Biden talked about in his State of the Union address the other night. And that is the importance of democracies being self-confident and democracies being powerful and democracies taking on in this battle for um, really for the future, the authoritarian powers who believe that their system is in the ascendancy. And as the president said the other night, and I think that nearly everyone in, in Congress would agree with him, democracy should be the way forward and it should be the organizing principle for the world. And so there's a lot to talk about. We've seen major changes over the past 100 days. We look forward to a very good set of conversations this morning. Thank you for joining us. Each of these three sessions will be a conversation by the interviewer, with our, um, with our guests, and then we'll leave time at the end of each session for all of you watching and listening today to answer questions. I think you all know Zoom technology, just press the raise hand button. If you can't make that work, there's always the chat and Q&A functions. You can alert our staff uh, to call on you for a question. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to welcome two good friends of mine and of the Aspen Strategy Group and two members of the Aspen Strategy Group, Tom Donilon, Steve Began, interviewed by Jennifer Griffin, Fox News. Jennifer, take it away. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nick. It's so great to be here today. I'm Jennifer Griffin. I serve as the National Security Correspondent for Fox News at the Pentagon. I've been there for the last 14 years. I was overseas before that for about 20 years with my last post in Israel for seven years. And I want to welcome uh, two guests who really need uh, very little introduction. Tom Donilon, you served as the National Security Advisor to uh, and Senior Advisor to President Obama on national security. And Steve Beagle, and whose last job was as Deputy Secretary of State, but has served in government dealing with these very difficult global issues for, for so many years. I want to start with, um, with both of you about take us into either the Situation Room or your last job and talk to me about what was the most dramatic day or difficult decision that you had to make in those jobs? Why don't we start with you, Steve? so fresh, Jennifer, that there are so many. Um, let me just uh, start with one. On my first day officially in office as Deputy Secretary of State was January 3rd of 2020. Uh, I came into the office uh, with the intention to get a, a good start on my, uh, on my new position, arrived around 6.30 in the morning. By seven o'clock, I was called down uh, to the State Department's Ops Center, uh, where we were briefed on uh, the uh, imminent execution of a strike against General Qasem Soleimani, the uh, head of the International Revolutionary Guard, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And by 4 p.m., that strike had been completed. That was my first day in the office. Um, the, uh, there were many more that followed. The, uh, uh, a couple of days later, we detected signs of an Iranian strike, counter strike against US uh, targets across the Persian Gulf. Um, it turned out to be a feint, but we uh, had about 50 minutes to get every American diplomat underground in our embassies across the post. I walked into the ops center and uh, gave the orders for them to alert the embassies. And it was like something out of a movie. Those people are incredible in the State Department Operations Center. They got every embassy on the line. They had alert systems, watch systems. It really is a well-oiled machine. And, and uh, it, it made the State Department ops center and the ops center team one of my favorite parts of the job as Deputy Secretary of State, really an incredible group of young men and women serving around the clock to protect the nation's interests. So these are some of the same kind of issues that President Biden is, is facing and, and the kind of pressure that he's under. Tom, what was your most dramatic day in the job? Well, there are a number of dramatic days. I mean, the most difficult days, Jennifer, are the, are the, uh, are the, are the days when you're making decisions as to whether to send men or women in our services, uh, military services into into harm's way. And we had a lot of those decisions to make. When uh, President Obama came into office, we had two hot wars uh, with substantial troop deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we were about to increase pretty significantly our increase, our, the size of our force in Afghanistan. We had a, a, you know, one of the most aggressive counterterrorism campaigns the country's ever, ever executed. So those, those are the most difficult days when you sit with the president, the president's making those decisions with knowledge uh, that he's putting in, at, at, in ri at risk uh, and in harm's way are the men and women who serve in our military services. But probably the most dramatic, the, the most dramatic uh, set of events were uh, 10 years ago this week. Uh, on Sunday, May 2nd, we will uh, mark the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the uh, operation against Osama bin Laden uh, in Abbottabad, Pakistan. And this was the week when we were leading up to that. In fact, uh, 10 years ago, last night, 10 years ago, the Thursday night before the raid, the president was in the Situation Room uh, with his most senior advisors, asking their final recommendation on whether or not to go ahead with the raid, uh, asking their final recommendation, their views on whether the raid was the right option, as opposed to other options that he had, a standoff bombing and some other options that we had. And the, uh, you know, it's a very clear memory and pretty dramatic, pretty dramatic when the president sitting in the Situation Room and the and the people sitting around the table were some of the most prominent people in national security in the United States. Joe Biden, now the president of the United States, Hillary Clinton, Bob Gates, Leon Panetta, uh, Mike Mullen, um, sitting around the room. And the president asked for final, uh, final recommendations as to whether or not to go ahead. And the room was split. And you know that we put it on our president, right? I, and I, I uh, walked back to the Oval Office with him after the. Uh, 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 after the meeting, and he had told the group that he would have his decision uh, the next day, which would have been this morning, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and um, I remember watching him walk back to the mansion from the West Wing of the White House and 
and it really striking, striking me that it strikes all of us that we put these tremendous decisions on the shoulders of one person. Uh, and of course, the next morning, 10 years ago today, uh, the president emailed around 7.30 uh, in the morning and said, I'd like to gather in the, in the diplomatic room, which as Steve knows is a room in the, low, the ground floor of the White House where you look out at a tremendous vista of, of, the, of, of Washington. And he came in and said, uh, I've made the decision. Uh, it's a raid. And I had gathered there with uh, Bill Daly, the chief of staff, and John Brennan, the, then the counterterrorism director, and, and would be gone to be uh, a CIA director, and Dennis McDonough, who was then deputy national security advisor and became chief of staff. Uh, he said, I've made my decision. It's the raid. Um, uh, draft the appropriate orders. Uh, and he walked out to the helicopter to go to Alabama to, uh, to, to view storm damage. Mm -hmm. And so those were. And of course, then on Sunday, we launched the raid. Uh, so we are on the 10th anniversary of some pretty dramatic events, certainly, I think in the country's history and certainly in my, in my experience in the White House. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, let me take you uh, to look at the last 100 days since you left office. What's your assessment of how the Biden team is doing? What's the biggest mistake they've made so far, do you think? Yeah, so um, when I was first invited to, to speak at this session, Jennifer, I, I have to say I reflected upon a, a kind of the absurdity of taking a measure of an administration 100 days in. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything, I think probably the measure of any administration should be taken out its last 100 days rather than its first 100 days. I actually looked back to see uh, how we started using this this uh, as a metric, as a yardstick for measuring presidents. and. And according to the History Channel, uh, it, 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 the origin is in uh, Napoleon's escape from Elba uh, at, uh, through his defeat at Waterloo, which transpired over exactly 100 days. And that became historically a marker for measuring success or failure of a leader. Um, Franklin Roosevelt resurrected it uh, early in his tenure, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, first 100 days as president in order to mark the progress uh, in, in fighting back against the domestic ravages of the Great Depression. And so here we are, we're stuck with a 100 day metric to measure something which is, is way too early. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I, 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 would, I would say that uh, I've seen or participated in a few discussions over the course of the last week on President Biden's 100 days, and I just find them way too gloomy and way too pessimistic. Um, not about President Biden necessarily, but just about the country and, and the issues we confront. And I, I think there's some real positives out there. And, and uh, I think they're worth highlighting. Uh, one is the country is not involved in major wars. We have, we have troops serving abroad uh, in, in harm's way in many places around the world. And we should never forget that and never forget them. But, um, but we aren't involved in any major wars currently. And, and no major hot wars were left uh, to the Biden administration. Uh, we have an economy that's rapidly rebounding, rapidly rebounding from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the, I guess the pause I would call it last week, because we had it last year, because we had a really strong economy going into the uh, beginning of 2020. Um, but obviously the shutdowns and everything else that were necessary to respond to the pandemic, put it on pause, but it seems to be rebounding uh, dramatically, all the more so with the stimulus that's that's being poured into it, we have um, we have a military that's strong and capable, and well funded. We have uh, relationships around the world that the Biden administration is rapidly advancing. Uh, our alliances and partnerships, the Quad, uh, has been mentioned already. Um, I will say that the the leaders' meeting of the Quad was something that was part of an agreement at the end of the previous administration. Um, in fact, the previous administration, I think, deserves uh, enormous credit for having resurrected the Quad. It had, had gone, uh, it had not met once uh, between 2007 and 2017. Um, and, uh, and during that interlude, it atrophied, but for a combination of reasons, including changing views of some of these partners themselves, we now have the makings of a very good partnership in the Indo-Pacific. And, and I'm very pleased uh, that the, the Biden administration has taken that on. Along with, um, along with building better relations, uh, restoring uh, a more positive tone with our NATO allies, but a, a NATO alliance that's now far more capable because of the resources the previous administration demanded upon it. You know, the last thing I'd say for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for, uh, in the positive is that there is a, a strong bipartisan consensus on most of the major foreign policy issues we face today, at least the geopolitical ones, like uh, climate change, immigration, trade, 
which have international dimensions are still contentious issues. But in a national security sense, in a, in a geopolitical sense, China, broad bipartisan uh, 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 common views on uh, Russia, the same on North Korea, the same. Um, I guess that the one watch out I'd have for President Biden is there's also a strong bipartisan view on Iran, but it is not one that is necessarily going to be supportive of his policies. Um, I, I believe that there is a strong bipartisan consensus on Iran to not rejoin the JCPOA in its current form. And I suspect if you put the JCPOA to a vote in the United States Congress, it would lose uh, by a significant margin, whether it could be done uh, as a piece of legislation and therefore vetoable is, uh, is that's the process that President, President Obama designed in order to create the patina of congressional support or at least absence of two thirds opposition. But I will say the one watch out is that uh, that President Biden has inherited a strong bipartisan consensus on the major foreign policy issues of the day, but in one, he's at risk of swimming against the tide. And that's on the Iran deal. Uh, Tom, let me read to you from David Ignatius's recent column about Biden's first 100 days, uh, where he says that countries are wondering whether the U.S. is a superpower in decline. Chinese diplomats lectured their American counterparts in Anchorage last month. Russia provocatively moved troops to the Ukraine border. Saudi Arabia and the UAE have secret back channel contacts with Iran, even as they request more U.S. weapons. As Biden enters his second 100 days, he needs a clearer strategy for projecting power. Hour. Your response yeah. and, and, and your assessment of the first 100 days. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Steve said, uh, uh, by the way, with respect to bipartisan consensus around some of the major foreign policy and national security issues facing the country. I, but responding to David's piece, I'd say this. I think the most important um, steps that the United States has taken in the national security foreign policy area has been on COVID and economic recovery. This has been absolutely essential, I think, Jennifer. You know, the, the, the successful ongoing campaign, a lot of challenges in front of us, but the ongoing campaign successful to date to distribute the vaccine uh, and the economic growth that's following on from that uh, is absolutely essential to, uh, to, to the United States standing in the world. Why do I say that? It's obviously key to the health outcomes in the United States. That's key to the economic recovery. Steve's exactly right. You know, most of the consensus now is that the economic recovery in the United States could approach 7% growth this year, which we haven't seen in almost four decades in the United States. Uh, that, by the way, that's something maybe we can talk about later. There's a tragic divergence between the United States and the developed world and the, um, and the emerging world, the other, uh, lesser developed countries. But what, so it's important in terms of health, it's important in terms of ec economics. It's also important in terms of our standing in the world, um, that uh, the United States has recovered this sense of resilience uh, if you will, of competence. You know, I, I think as I reflect on it, since World War II, one of the most, one of the, one of the essential elements of U.S. ability to influence the world, act in the world, has been the reality and the perception of its competence, an America can-do attitude. And I think this recovery of resilience has been absolutely essential uh, in, in terms of in terms of U.S. position, U.S. position in the world, which we lost some of, I think, in 2020 during the course of the COVID COVID crisis. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I think uh, going to Alaska, where of course, uh, Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met up with uh, the Director for Foreign Foreign uh, Policy at the in the, Commun in the uh, Communist Party mechanism in China, Yang Shishu, and the Foreign Minister Wang Yi. It would have been really difficult to go to that meeting, I think, absent the passage of the American Rescue Act, which is the COVID Relief Act, and the the, the snapback in the uh, in the United States, uh, both in terms of health and uh, and economics. So I think that the United States is on a path towards doing that. We're doing a number of other things. Obviously, Steve mentioned, I think, that bringing allies front and center is a, is a hallmark of this administration. That is a strong instinct of President Biden and Secretary of State uh, Blinken. Uh, think sequencing allies first, and most of the policies that we're pursuing uh, around the world. It's a strong team that's been put in place. I think a strong, experienced uh, team. And it's and, uh, you know, one last thing, I think, that in terms of, uh, in terms of going forward, uh, in terms of demonstrating strength, We've also, I think President Biden has also brought uh, the key issues ahead of us to the center of our foreign policy making. What do I mean by that? Climate, where the United States is now kind of joined into the consensus and tr trying to lead the, lead the effort around the world with respect to climate. Uh, on cyber, where I think we've really had a really terrific set of appointments and kind of a reorganization of how we deal with cyber and on health issues. So I think um, uh, the president is building a very 
I think, good platform to project US leadership and that kind of strength that David Ignatius is talking about. And the last thing I'll say on this is, it's something I don't think that you can, Nick, you can ask uh, Jake about this when he comes in later today, but he doesn't use the phrase. But I think what the US strategy is really uh, reminiscent of is Dean Acheson's phrase of building situations of strength. That's what this is about. Situations of strength at home and with, with respect to allies, which is a unique American asset, and with respect to challenges that we face in the future. So I think that it's a big part of it. I think it's a big thrust of the Biden policy, uh, Jennifer, is actually to kind of build out these situations of strength from which then we can operate uh, and advance our interests. Tom, let me just follow up on one of the points you make, and that is, don't you think the COVID recovery here in the U.S. will be undermined if the Biden administration doesn't do more to get vaccines to India and Brazil? I mean, you could have two failed states. You could have, you're, you're seeing states around the world as the, the virus rages in some of the developing countries where you, you could have, you know, you have protesters now taking on the government because they don't have access to vaccines. They're dying by, you know, the millions. It's, it's, it's not under control elsewhere. Yeah, that's a super important question, Jennifer. Uh, I think in the first instance, of course, it is a U.S. responsibility. And I think, again, in order to allow us to kind of move up, up from our platform, to deal with our to deal with our challenges at home, including the including the virus and vaccinations and uh, the economic recovery is doing that. But you're exactly right. The divergence in the world is really striking right now, and the fact is, of course, is that we won't be fully safe as Americans from this virus as long as it's still you know kind of at war with the world, right? So and. Uh, and from a number of perspectives, right, including, by the way, the development of future variants, the longer this goes on. And so I do think that as the United States gets itself in a, in a, in a, in a strong position, and we're seeing this already, you saw announcements yesterday that the United States is sending support to India. Uh, there's a big discussion, an important discussion underway today, right, about uh, the uh, about the lifting, if, if only temporarily, of intellectual property and patent protections uh, around some of these, uh, around the, uh, the the core virus, uh, core vaccine products, excuse me, and if, in order to have them produced more easily around the world. Uh, but I think that's that is that is that's a challenge, Jennifer. I think that kind of is now kind of becoming uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 front uh, front and center for uh, uh, for the United States uh, in terms of policy and for the world. We do have this tremendous divergence. And it is going to have to be addressed through, I think, strong and creative work to try to get uh, to try to get uh, uh, the more progress in the in the emer in the emerging markets. And we see this in Latin America uh, as well as as well as in India. It's a really important question, and it's going to require a lot of effort and kind of creative work. Tom, it looks like we might have lost your video. So why don't you? I'll turn to Steve while you work on that. Um, Steve, we saw Russia make some moves, Putin make some moves. It seemed like he anticipated that he knew that the response was coming. Biden had said that he, uh, he was going to respond to the solar winds hack as well as other uh, recalibration of the relationship. He, he, President Biden called him a killer in that interview with ABC. What do you think was behind Putin's moves to the border with the Ukraine? Was that a bluff? Was that just to divert from what was happening with De Navalny at home? What, what was behind it? Was he ever really thinking of invading uh, Ukraine or, or moving further into the Donbass? Yeah, uh, Jennifer, that's a very good question. And I, th uh, I think that one that many of us who follow Russia closely have been puzzling over or were puzzling over. And, and even now it's not a complete uh, uh, stand down, but it is significantly less tense than it was. I, I am, I'm not absolutely sure President Putin knew what his goal was there, at least uh, what his final goal was. But I think uh, his initial goal was to make it clear that Russia would not be ignored and that Russia had tools at its disposal and it could influence the course of events. And, and in a sense, it, it, that is correct that uh, you know, our ability and uh, much less our political willingness to defend the Ukrainian-Russian border is simply not there. And so uh, it was a reminder, I think, of sorts. Whether or not it was intended to generate the kind of attention it got, uh, and in some cases, the response probably was something the Russians would not like. Many uh, Russian diplomats have been expelled from countries around Europe and, and here in the United States. Um, various forms of Russian misbehavior are, if anything, under increasing scrutiny by the United States and its partners uh, in Europe. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, it, it was entirely the, the return he wanted, 
but uh, President Biden did something uh, that I, I personally think was uh, was uh, a good idea. Was he also proposed to sit down with President Putin in a summit? Um, I know that uh, many of my uh, brethren in the in the uh, analytical community on Russia disagree with that decision, um, but I, I do think that. Uh, I can see the contours of what the Biden administration is trying to do with Russia. The initial wave of sanctions, and it, it, I, I do think that the, the reference to Putin as a killer was a, a, a something, a word that is something that Putin, that President Biden simply blurted out. Um, and frankly, the words were put into his mouth by the interviewer, and he 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 went with it. Um, I think, on reflection, um, probably his advisors would not have encouraged him to say that, but. As we always do in politics, the, uh, there's a quick uh, circling of the wagons in an attempt to make a virtue out of misstatements by our leaders. Uh, I've had to do it, um, and and uh, I'm sure that our my counterparts in this administration uh, were compelled to do the same. But I, I, setting that aside, what the Biden administration, the broad strokes of the Biden administration policy on Russia seem to me um, first to reset it and try to find the bottom, and so the sanctions. You know, I think in administration officials' words, the sanctions were kind of unfinished business, a correction of sorts to get us uh, to a point where we have made clear what our bottom line is on both uh, uh, election interference information campaigns uh, targeting U.S. candidates and on uh, issues like uh, um, intrusion into U.S. networks with the potential for sabotage. Uh, the second part of the Biden administration's policy, and one that I think uh, Secretary Blinken has has advanced very quickly is working closely with our partners, particularly in Europe, to try to have a common front on the, on the concerns we have with Russia. And I think both of these are cheap. Now, having set those stages, you move to the third, which is an engagement. And I, I can't possibly predict what the outcome of a uh, summit would be between President Putin and President Biden, but we should know soon enough because the um, National Security Advisor, President Putin, at least has indicated that that summit is likely to occur in the next two months, and so and so we'll know. So, um, you know, the uh, I, I think I think generally uh, the administration is on the right track. And unlike many of the other policy issues here, they've done something which I would encourage them to do as well, which is you know they they acted a little bit unconventionally. Uh, if I had one critique for the Biden foreign policy, uh, and it's something probably many countries around the world welcome com uh, compared to the last four years, is it's become it, that it's becoming very conventional. And predictable. Now there are advantages to that, of course. We're a big power, and you want to move slowly, and you want to telegraph where you're going. So there are advantages to that. I'm not, I'm not critical of conventionality, but occasionally look for the opportunities too, uh, uh, unconventionally. Um, and and I think that's where the previous administration actually had its greatest successes, is when it acted unconventionally. What was the most unpredictable thing that President Trump did that you thought helped the nation um, from a foreign policy perspective in, the, in hindsight? What maybe surprised you, but then led to a breakthrough? Yeah, well, um, uh, we can talk about North Korea at greater length later, but at a minimum, the president, President Trump tested the proposition that the North Koreans have long ab advanced, which is that if only the leaders could meet, then all things were resolvable. We learned an enormous amount in our in my eight meetings with the North Korean counterparts over the course of the last two and a half years on where North Korea is, what's the nature of its system, what, uh, where, what its direction is. And we also managed to maintain stability on the Korean Peninsula after a cycle of escalation that transitioned from the Obama administration into the Trump administration that in 2017 seemed like it was very possibly leading to a war on the Korean Peninsula. Um, the other one was the Abraham Accords. Um, you know, uh, hidebound, barnacled foreign policy disputes from half century ago were preventing the success of U.S. governments from taking action that could bring greater peace and stability in the Middle East. And uh, the Abraham Accords, which were kind of a, a classic uh, foreign policy of the previous administration, a combination of transactional, um, uh, detached from the conventions and the strictures that previous presidents felt compelled to abide by. You know, Jennifer, uh, just in the Middle East, I have worked on every Republican presidential campaign since 1996. Every single party platform called for the relocation of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Every single one. And by the way, the Democratic Party platforms did as well. And no president did. That happened. Things have shifted. Those are unconventional acts that have created, in my view, 
a more peaceful and stable potential for the Middle East uh, than the, even uh, that inherited by, uh, by the previous administration. Tom, you were sent by President Obama three times to meet with um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And you see what has, there have been incidents with Iran gunboats for the first time twice in the last month coming up to US warships in, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, the Israelis clearly don't want the talks to move forward on the negotiations for a, a nuclear deal. They don't believe it'll work. Do you feel that the Israelis are playing a positive or a negative role right now with regards to Iran? And how concerned are you about these, this, these, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps going its own route against uh, you know, separating and, and really calling the shots in Iran and perhaps provoking the US military into a conflict? Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, I, wanted to, I just wanted to follow up on Steve's uh, good comments on Russia, because I do think there is, there is bipartisan to look at this. I do think that, um, I do think it's fair to say, Steve, though, that, uh, that President Biden comes at Putin a little more differently than President Trump did. I think that's a fair statement. He's, know, he's known him a long time. Um, he's had in, uh, encounters with him. And I think he has a you know, firm view as to the kind of the, the hostility across the board that Putin and Russia faces here. And, you know, so it's a different, it is a different personal approach, I think, that President Biden will take. I do think that it's fair to say that the initial steps have been to deal with some of these kind of leftover business, historical issues, particularly with respect to solar winds and election interference and things like that. One thing I'd add to, you, to your points though on the importance of having NATO together and focused on, on Russia, uh, which I think that, the, uh, that President Biden, and of course, the, you know, Biden and Blinken are, are committed Atlanticists, right? This is really where they have come from in their, uh, in their, in their careers. And so there's a, there's a strong view with respect to the importance of NATO. I just wanted to mention two other things, Jennifer, and then I'll get to the, the Israel Middle East, Middle East point, which is it's also the importance here in the United States. Yeah, yes, contain Russian, uh, Russia, Russia aggression, absolutely. Uh, but also to, to, to engage in steps at, in the United States where we protect ourselves much better. And that goes to the cyber issue, where in fact, I do think we have a lot of work to do. You know, if you look at the current state of the cyber world, uh, we have shown that Solar wind is a good example of this. We can't protect our federal networks at this point. Um, we have difficulty protecting the very tools that we have with our intelligence services. A uh, uh, sh shadow broker showed, showed that. We have an epidemic of ransomware uh, in the United States. I think that's a really important building crisis. Uh, we have the build out here of an Internet of Things system with thousands and millions and billions ultimately of of sensors and we don't really have policies to kind of build in security from the start there. This is a really important, uh, I think, point uh, for us to focus on generally, but also with respect to Russia. And the second is Russian corruption, uh, where I really do hope, and I think you'll see that, and again, you'll, you, you, you all will talk to, to uh, Secretary Hicks and, and National Security Advisor uh, Sullivan today. I really think that focusing on this uh, transparency, anti-corruption efforts, the number of pieces of legislation that passed out of the Congress on this is really important. Now to the Middle East. Um, sorry about the diversion there, but I think those are important, uh, important, important points. I think with respect to the, uh, with, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, I do know the Israeli team quite well, uh, as, you, uh, as, as you pointed out. Um, and they were obviously dissatisfied with the, with the Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, I have a different view than, than Steve kind of on, on the history of this and maybe where it is today. I think the nuclear deal was actually working. It was not meant to be a transformational effort by the United States to transform somehow every Iran or all the malign behavior that Iran engaged in. It was a, it's an arms control deal, it was an arms control deal. And by every account it was working in terms of rolling back and freezing the Iranian march towards a, uh, uh, or efforts towards a, uh, uh, towards a nuclear uh, towards a nuclear weapon and i do think we need to get back to some sort of base from which we can operate and start to deal with some of the additional problems including ballistic missiles and the conduct of iran in um uh, uh in the region <clears throat> now on israel uh you know, and again i don't you know you can you, you, you read the reports i don't have any classified analysis as to exactly uh, what the roots were of the uh, latest attack on the Natanz uh, nuclear facility and the attack on the uh, power supply there. I think most people assume that it's, it's Israel. But the important point was this, uh, is that right after that attack, the Iranians still came to the table for the proximity talks in Vienna, which I think indicates the pressure that they're under. And I think the Iranian desire to reach, a, a, to reach some sort of deal um, 
uh, from which we can move from which we can move uh, which we can move forward. Um, the United States and Israel, I think, have had uh, important talks on this. You know, again, the the uh, the Israeli team was just in Washington this week uh, to go over this and other uh, and other issues. So uh, you'll have different views on this. Uh, I think, in some ways, the uh, uh, the pressure that the Israelis put on uh, put on Iran moves them, uh, incentivizes them to 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 move on a uh, actually to move on a deal. I do, by the way, think that Steve's point on the Abraham Accords is correct. Um, and I think it's something I wish the Biden administration looks to build. Let me interrupt and jump into a follow up on the cyber issue. It's obviously both you've spent a lot of time on it, Tom, Steve, you were um, at the State Department when the solar winds hack was was taking place. Steve, do you think that the Biden administration's response to solar winds was strong enough? Well, I, I think I think their uh, punitive measures, um, which uh, I would say, uh, I would hasten to point out, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan said will be seen and unseen, um, uh, seems sufficient and well-conceived uh, to send a message and, and try to reinforce a norm that, uh, that is going to be necessary for all countries to abide by if we're going to have an open internet globally. Uh, but I, I also want to say that there's a lot more that needs to be done, and I, and I, I have I have full confidence that this, this the Pre President Biden's administration is well underway to do that. They have an outstanding team in the White House uh, working on these cyber issues uh, to, to lead this effort. Uh, they are looking at uh, comprehensively at the weaknesses in the system, uh, the vulnerabilities that oftentimes are, are uh, a side product of the free and open society that we choose to live in. You know, I was listening to uh, 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 someone much smarter than me on these issues a few days ago talk about how if we had to do it over again, we might have made this a, a national infrastructure that the internet and the, and the and the and the the nodes and the and the server system and all 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 that uh, runs our daily interactions on the internet um, might have been better done as a government uh, initiative. Now, leaving aside the fact that market drivers likely are why it was so successful and why it's so ubiquitous. Um, it does raise a, a very important vulnerability is that the, the internet and cybersecurity are only as strong as the weakest link. And uh, you know, I, I would reflect at the State Department that we had 76,000 employees based in embassies and consulates in nearly 200 locations around the world. Each person in those embassies would have at least one device, a mobile device, uh, maybe a, maybe a, an iPad, maybe a, as well as a desktop or a laptop. And every minute of every day, they were under attack electronically by both state and non-state actors. It is a formidable challenge, Jennifer, and one that fundamentally we have to do better ourselves. I think the first, you know, I, I appreciate and support uh, what President Biden did uh, in response to this, as I as I, I, I should hasten to add, in case Tom misunderstood me, as I agree with much of what he's done on uh, on U.S. Russia relations, but at the at the end of the day, if we're going to get better on cyber. It's got to be us. We've got to be better. Um, and and uh, I know the administration is working hard on this. You know, Jennifer, just to comment on Steve's one, because he's exactly right. This, this is, a, I chaired the National Commission on Cybersecurity in 2016, and we actually briefed into the Trump, uh, the Trump transition at the beginning of 2017. Um, he's exactly right. You know, we designed the internet without security in mind. Uh, it was basically uh, seen as a kind of a, and it turned out to be a spectacular invention and opportunity for, uh, for the world. But we have systematically and consistently neglected the security side of this, and we need to do a much better much better job on this. Uh, and we got to start with our federal networks, as I said. It's not, it's just, we are not anywhere near where we need to be in our federal networks. It needs to be, needs to be a priority that we're still using passwords and don't have dual factor authentication, kind of the basic things here, you know, yeah. uh, is really not, you know, no, no tech company in this country, by the way, uh, would operate with that level of, of that, that, with that deficiency in, uh, in security. We have lots of things that we can do. Uh, we can use the federal procurement system, by the way, to force change into the system as the biggest buyer of things in the, uh, in the world. Uh, I think we can have kind of in in intense efforts around trying to deal with, with ransomware. But it's interesting, you know, Steve, I think you're exactly right. It has to start with us. And there's a lot of, there'll be a lot of discussions in the Situation Room about 
high concepts of deterrence and uh, and, uh, and whether it's cyber attacks can be deterred and all, and, and all that. And that's really important going forward. But we need to start with the nuts and bolts where we're really deficient in the United States, frankly. Nicole Perloff has written a really good book um, from the New York Times, right, um, on this, which she, which she points out that essentially we have, we've got, we, we don't, haven't, we haven't really spent anywhere near the time, attention, and resources on the, on the nuts and bolts defense of the United States networks. And we need to start, we need to start doing that in a big way. I agree with you. The team that Biden's brought in is really superb uh, with Nan Newberger in the White House and, and now nominations of uh, Chris Inglis, uh, whom you know, Steve, and, uh, um, and Jen Easterly uh, at the, the new position of cybersecurity director in the White House and then in the head of CISA. Uh, I think it's a good team, but the focus on these fundamentals and what we do here, I think has really got to be given a higher priority. We have about, we have only a few minutes left and I'd like to tell the audience that we'll have uh, in 10 minutes, we'll take your questions, but I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about China and the potential flashpoint that Taiwan poses. You had two dozen warplanes buzzing Taiwan in the last <clears throat> few weeks. Um, you know, the there was a discussion on Capitol Hill. Uh, DNI Avril Haines said that maybe time was asked by Jack Reed, Senator Jack Reed, whether it's time to abandon strategic ambiguity. I'd like to get both of your thoughts on that. Is it time to um, issue a warning really to China that, that it's no more strategic ambiguity. We will defend Taiwan if they're attacked. You can start, Steve. Okay, well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this uh, debate about uh, whether or not to do away with strategic ambiguity uh, uh, has been uh, simmering uh, for some time. Uh, people like uh, uh, Bob, uh, uh, Bob Blackwell, Phil Zellico have written uh, very intelligently about this. Uh, Richard Haas has done the same at the Council on Foreign Relations with others. Here's what, here's what I would say about uh, ambiguity. Ambiguity works if the deterrent is convincing. And Clarity does not work if the deterrent is ambiguous. So we have to do one of two things. We either have to make clear to the Chinese government that we will that we will defend Taiwan and that we will do whatever it takes at that moment if they choose to move on Taiwan, recognizing in my view today that it is a gamble as to whether or not we can defend Taiwan sufficiently uh, uh, despite that clarity. Alternatively, we can keep the policy of strategic ambiguity, but we need to make it much more clear to the Chinese that they will be defeated if they seek to change the status on the Taiwan Straits through coercion or the use of force. Um, that means uh, initiatives like the Biden administration's efforts to advance even further the, uh, the quad alignment that they inherited. That means transforming the US-South Korea alliance. You know, I, I commend the, the Biden administration for very quickly moving to solidify the US-South Korea relationship by agreeing to the cost sharing formula under the special measures agreement. They did this in their first few weeks in office, but that was never the issue. The issue is transforming the US ROK alliance so that it is part of our Indo-Pacific strategy and our shared interests in the Indo-Pacific strategy. And here uh, lies another challenge I think that's out there um, uh, for this administration or any administration is that countries, many countries in the Indo-Pacific aren't clear where they wanna come down and frankly are uncomfortable getting drawn into the middle. We've heard it from the, uh, from the Kiwis in New Zealand. We've heard it from the Singaporeans last uh, two years ago at the Shangri-La Forum. In, uh, in Singapore, the, uh, the Prime Minister of, of Singapore pleaded to not have to pick sides between the United States and China. And we hear it very much coming from Seoul today as well. Now, our policy should not be um, pick a side. Our policy should be to systematically build out the capabilities and relationships that create a convincing deterrent to China that says that yes, competition is fine. But coercion or the attempt uh, uh, to, uh, to subvert other countries or uh, to, to, uh, uh, to change the status quo uh, on the Taiwan Straits through the use of force, um, those, will, uh, those will be deterred. And, uh, and we need to do better in order to get there. Steve, would we go to war 
over Taiwan to protect supercomputer chips? There's been a lot of talk of that recently. Well, uh, the United States says that, uh, said it will it will defend uh, Taiwan uh, uh, in the case that uh, there's an attempt to change the status quo by force. Uh, you are not going to go to war if there's a uh, leveraged buyout of TSMC. Um, but uh, you know certainly this only uh, adds to the concerns, which is that Taiwan uh, is it has a remarkable success in producing the most sophisticated uh, computer chips in the world today. Uh, and that and that production is almost exclusive is exclusively located on the island of Taiwan. But but the concerns are bigger than that. It's not just about chip technology. It's about the basic march of freedom in the world and and the rights of self determination within within the systems. We support a one China policy, but we do not support the subversion of, of Taiwan's democracy as part of that equation. That is for the Chinese people to sort through without the use of force. Um, how is Biden's approach to China different from President Trump's? The, um, there's a lot of continuity, particularly in the end. And I have to say that the, the meeting that I saw, uh, with the parts of the meetings that we saw in Anchorage uh, was very similar to the, the three such meetings that happened at the, at the same level uh, in, in the previous administration. Um, I think you know, I, one of the things that... Uh, you know, constantly frustrated. Uh, well, one of the one of the self-inflicted wounds of the previous administration is the inability to work to to sort issues, to primary, secondary, tertiary, and focus intently on addressing the issues of primary concern. And so, it was it was uh, it was challenging at times to be on the one hand working ever more closely with with the government of India in bolstering the, the quad and in, in improving the participation in the Malabar uh, naval exercises in the Indian Ocean. And then at the same time, have a different part of the government imposing punitive tariffs on uh, Indian products because they were being brought in the United States in competition to US industries. And you know, the, 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 the incoherence of that made it very difficult to advance partnerships. I think um, the Biden administration has inherited uh, a very good platform in the Indo-Pacific, but I think they have huge upside potential to strengthen and deepen that, to regularize it, that, and, and to uh, uh, to maybe even make some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, relationships uh, into more durable structures. Um, it is it is the wheelhouse of the Biden administration and the very capable people who lead its foreign policy and national security. Um, and, and it's an area that I think is, is rich with opportunity uh, for the Biden administration. I, wanna, I agree with that. Jennifer. I wanna give, yeah. yeah, I want to give Tom, Tom, I want you to respond. We're starting to yeah. run out of time and I want to get okay. to questions, but I also, Great. China is so important. I want to give you a chance yeah. to respond, Tom. Yeah, a couple of things. I, I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate what Steve said. I think that the, and there's been, as I said, there's a bipartisan consensus in this country with respect to China and us moving to a much more competitive phase. Um, it's um, it's embedded now, I think, in just in U.S. Uh, in, in U.S. policy. That's what President Biden's actually said. We have a you know, we're in a period of extreme competition. And he was very clear about the competition in his uh, talk to Congress on Wednesday night. Couldn't have been clearer. Um, I think there are three or four differences, though, Jennifer, which I'd point to. The first is um, uh, again building out on uh, some of the work that the previous administration did, but really much more intensively on the allied piece. Uh, and Steve mentioned the. Uh, the basing arrangements and cost sharing arrangements in, in Korea, um, the work I think that can be that can be done here on the on the trilateral relationship among the United States, Korea, uh, and uh, and Japan. That's all I think front and center. But critically, I think is the domestic renewal agenda. Uh, what 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 President Biden laid out in uh, in his talk on uh, on Wednesday night with a, with with a number of allusions to China and the challenge that China faces. In terms of a kind of a fundamental, if you will, kind of uh, decision in the world, right about about the future of democracy and the ability of it to deliver for its people, uh, this this uh, domestic renewal with a particular focus on technology is absolutely critical. That the United States identify those areas, those technologies where it's important for it to continue to have leadership, and it acts decisively with resources and focus uh, to do that. That really is, I think, kind of the critical kind of a critical difference here. Uh, uh, as we move, or, or as we move, or the next evolution, if you will, as we move forward. I also think, with respect to defense, um, 
we need to have a focus on doctrine and resources. Uh, and Eli Ratner, the Defense Department's lead. And the last thing I'll say is there's a much bigger focus on human rights. I don't want to forget Afghanistan and looking out for the next 100 days before we quickly go to questions. What do you think the next 100 days, the biggest challenge will be and how will we avoid Afghanistan, the pullout from Afghanistan ending the way the pullout from Iraq did and us having to go back in? Tom? Yeah, I, don't, I think that I don't think the two situations that we can have an all morning seminar and I don't think the two I don't think the two situations are at all comparable between uh, Iraq and uh, in us implementing essentially what was the Bush deadline to December 31st of 2011 in the situation in Afghanistan. I think if you were to step back uh, and, and just sit again, you, and for you started this conversation by asking about situa situation room meetings. And if you were to go into the president of the United States today and do a global threat assessment, look around the world and ask yourself, where should we apply our resources? You wouldn't have a significant uh, military presence in, in Afghanistan. Um, and so I think the challenges going forward here uh, are to obviously execute the execute the withdrawal safely uh, over the, over the time between now and uh, uh, and uh, September 11th, uh, uh, 2001. Uh, that we need to develop uh, and adjust the intelligence uh, focus operations uh, suite, as Bill Burns called them in his testimony, kind of the suite of capabilities we have to anticipate and contest uh, reconstitution of uh, terrorist threats. And then, of course, to work on the military over the horizon capabilities that we have. I have a lot of confidence, by the way, that we have capabilities in both those areas, both on the intelligence side and on the, in the military side, to be, able to, to be able to continue to protect the country. I think we'll have strategic warning with respect to the reconstitution of, of terrorist threats, particularly by al-Qaeda and ISIS. I think we have the military capability we've developed over the last 20 years to, uh, to deal with. And the last thing I'll say is we have leverage on Afghanistan, aside from aside from military leverage, and that includes, it includes the fact that 80% of the Afghan national budget comes from foreign assistance. That's a lot of leverage on whatever group of people is governing Afghanistan going forward. Great, I'd like to turn to questions in our last eight minutes and I'll start if you can introduce yourself and then explain who you are addressing your question to. We'll start with Farah Pandith. Uh, good morning, and what a pleasure it is to see you. Um, I have a question that's actually related to what Tom was just saying about CT um, more broadly. Uh, the, the first 100 days has been focused, obviously, on domestic terrorism and what happened on the 6th of January, um, importantly. But we're increasingly seeing the ideology of the far-right extremists um, be executed around the world in different kinds of ways um, and actually has challenged our imagination. Uh, so the threat landscape on the ideology of extremist groups has changed. So my question is, what should the administration be doing as we think about the next 10 years uh, of millennials, Gen Z and Gen Alpha being subjected to the kind of far right extremist ideology alongside the resurgence of what will be uh, the so-called Islamic State type ideology? Thanks. <clears throat> Tom, you want to take that? That's a, that's a big topic, obviously. I think a couple of things. I think, and it's nice to see you. Um, one is that, uh, as you said, the, the uh, Islamic radical terror threat has not gone away, but it has been diminished. I think, again, if you cite the real Haynes and, and Bill Burns' testimony at the Worldwide Threat Assessment Briefing uh, two weeks ago, you know, indicated that you know, uh, over the course of the last you know, decade and more, we have diminished, we have diminished that, that threat. It hasn't gone away, it's been dispersed. As I said in my earlier conversation with, uh, with Jennifer, I think we have the, the ways to, to both have the intelligence that we need on it and to have the military, uh, the military um, doctrine, capabilities, uh, techniques to, to, uh, to deal with it. This issue though about um, um, right-wing extremism um, is uh, obviously front and center in the United States, but I agree with you. It is, a, it is, a, it is, a, it's a, it's a building issue around the world, and one that I think, in the first instance, needs to be called out. Uh, and part of calling this out, by the way, I think, is the is the, the the construct, if you will, that President Biden laid out in the in the speech on Wednesday night, which is this construct between um, a democracy and authoritarian authoritarian regimes including the critical point about the ability of democracy to, del to deliver its for its people. But this conversation, I think, is exactly right about the threat of uh, right-wing extremism to the, to the to core democracies around the world 
It's an important conversation and one that needs to kind of become front and center. And I think that President Biden began that conversation on Wednesday night. And now I'd like to go to Christopher Painter, who has a question. Good to see you again, uh, Tom. Uh, Chris, Chris Painter on the government for many, many years, formerly in the government doing cyber stuff. Yeah. Uh, back on, on the cyber issue, uh, look, I agree with you that defense is really important and we need to do that better. Uh, but there's also the other half of the equation, which is imposing costs and trying to at least shape the uh, the behavior of our adversaries. And we haven't done that very well, frankly. We certainly haven't done that very well with Russia. So what I see is a calibrated response so far from the Biden administration, both you know hitting them, but also engage, trying to engage in dialogue. But what other things can we do uh, that would actually shape Putin's behavior? I, I think there's a lot of things people have talked about, about money flows and other things that we haven't really gone to. But, but is this something where we can shape his behavior? Or are we going to just have to continue to deal with a, a very aggressive Russia in cyberspace and outside cyberspace uh, for the foreseeable future? I think, I, and certainly Steve can comment on this as well. I think that uh, a, number, a number of the responses, Chris, to, um, uh, to uh, Russia cyber attacks in the United States uh, has to be outside the cyber realm. Uh, and that obviously is sanctions. But I, and it is, I think, the... Um, I just think we can do a lot better on, on, the, uh, on the defensive side, but it is basically uh, doing our best to kind of create the environment around Putin in which he has to operate. And that begins, I think, in, in Europe, as we've talked about with respect to having NATO much more focused on the Russia, on the Russia threat with the, with the US leadership. But it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, kind of a, uh, it's kind of an all of the above uh, assessment, don't you think, that we need to kind of bring, bring to bear, you know, out, outside the cyber realm, uh, pressures, on, pressures on Putin. Um, and and engage uh, and engage on uh, on rules of the road with uh, uh, with Putin. The other piece of this, of course, uh, more broadly, is uh, is the constructing of uh, alliances uh, around these technology issues uh, outside the construct of kind of the core alliances of NATO and the various alliances we have and the more general alliances we have in Asia. But constructing bespoke alliances around these technology issues. I think, is a, I think is an important step that we can take. It was a really important piece by Richard Fontaine and Jerry Cohen in Foreign Affairs last year on the creation of these kinds of alliances. So I think can establish norms in the world, uh, can um, I think put, put uh, ask uh, uh, like-minded countries to, uh, uh, to join uh, and to um, I think establish kind of rules of the road which makes sense, which makes sense for uh, us in the world. We have, let's see, um, we have time for just one more question. Um, Elizabeth Economy. Uh, thanks so much, Liz Economy from uh, Hoover and the Council on Foreign Relations. Really fantastic uh, set of remarks. Thanks to both of you. Um, so when we talk about allies and partners, we often are focused on Europe and Asia, sort of our traditional uh, allies and partners. Uh, but when you look at what China brings to the table, uh, when we criticize them on Xinjiang or South China Sea, uh, or Hong Kong, they bring 30, 40, 50 countries from Africa, uh, sometimes from Latin America, Southeast Asia, developing economies, Middle East. Um, how do we begin to reach out to these countries that are supporting China, uh, in fact? How do we begin to expand what we uh, consider to be allies and partners uh, so that we really begin to make some headway uh, into this block that China has created? Yeah. I think Steve right. should take that year on. Steve's on the, was on, most recently on the front, the front line of diplomacy in that area, Steve. And I'll just mention, Steve, we're coming up against the end of this, uh, the, the program. So we have about one or two minutes left. OK, thank you. Well, uh, Elizabeth, thanks for the question. And, and, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it's parts of the uh, agenda we haven't talked about that are going to be very important uh, to, to us deepening our influence. It's going to be uh, resolving uh, issues uh, around refugees and immigration, around aid, around restoration of the global economy. You know, we, there's a huge opportunity for the United States with foreign aid to shape the recovery of the world from the COVID pandemic, a pandemic that's still very much upon us, as, as has been said. Um, uh, and also uh, also the, the, the climate issue may offer an opportunity here. The, um, we need to work through international institutions like the uh, Organization of American States, the African Union, the Arab League, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, aside from uh, all the instruments that we've used and perhaps overused in Europe over the last uh, 30 years, I think the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe offers us a huge opportunity to build out those relationships. So it's gonna be a combination of, uh, of uh, our traditional uses of 
softer power, maybe not entirely soft power. It's going to be working uh, uh, through uh, organizations with effective diplomacy uh, to get aligned views on uh, on, on issues uh, that that uh, challenge all of us. Uh, and, uh, and and lastly, uh, I you know I think it's it's going to be the United States modeling a uh, a behavior in the world that is has a a healthier and more palpable uh, dimension of altruism. Uh, I think that, I think the United it's it's the it's the United States' world to win over uh, on the side of a rules based international order, um, and and I'm I'm confident that that opportunity can be uh, can be uh, uh, really achieved. And Jennifer, I, wanna... I would just I would just underscore the climate point that Steve made as as a real opportunity for U.S. leadership. But I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I want to thank you both. We're up against the end of our program, but I think what's extraordinary is how much bipartisan agreement we heard from both of you serving two very different administrations. And um, it gives us hope that, that the nation can come together on foreign policy and national security issues. Nick, I'll throw it back to you. Jennifer, thank you so much for um, your really good moderation of a panel that could have gone on for another one to two hours. And I want to thank my good friend Tom Donilon and my good friend Steve Began. I, I agree with you. My takeaway from the last hour, and I listened very carefully, is we're a badly divided country, but Republicans and Democrats in foreign and defense policy on the major issues are thinking alike. I think there is a degree of bipartisanship. I hope we'll see it. Certainly, Steve's right. When Steve said that the Trump administration had revived the Quad, he's exactly right. And now you've seen President Biden take it to the first head of government meeting. I think on China, there's a, there's a recognition we have to compete with China. We have to contain Russia. We have to rebuild NATO. And this last conversation that you had, very important about advancing our cyber capacity in the world and the appointments that have been made at the National Security Council there, so important. Finally, Jennifer, I just threw out this conversation, the need for us to have self-confidence as a democracy that's a Democrat and Republican issue. And to take on the authoritarian powers as the president has been suggesting in every opportunity that he's had, it gives me hope that despite our domestic difficulties, we Americans can be together on foreign policy. So Steve, thank you very much. Tom, thank you very much. And Jennifer, thank you. Now we're